Thank you. <laughs> the Milton Coalition is made up of town leaders from across many sectors, including education, public safety, health care, um, business, youth, parents, uh, and many others. Uh, together, we all come together to work on preventing youth substance use and promoting, promoting mental health among youth. We operate from a drug-free communities grant that comes from the CDC. So why does Milton need a substance use prevention coalition? So back in 2014, our health director, Caroline Kinsella, saw an increase in use of drugs and alcohol among youth. So she brought together some people in the community, including uh, Lori Stillman and Deborah Milbauer, to work on this problem. And together they undertook a community assessment where they did surveys, focus groups, key informant interviews to find out exactly what the problem is. And uh, those results came out in 2016, and what they found was disturbing. Um, it showed a rate of binge drinking among youth almost twice the state average. Um, drinking in the past month, 14% higher than the state, and marijuana use, 8% higher than the state. And why is this worrisome? The earlier someone starts to use drugs and alcohol, the more likely they will develop a substance use disorder. Substance use is a critical public health issue. There are links to cancer, motor vehicle accidents, deaths, heart disease, risky behavior like unprotected sex, crime, and more. It impacts the health and well-being of millions of people around the world. And the thing is, it's totally preventable. In 2018, the health department was awarded this grant that I just spoke about uh, based on the work of these residents and also the community assessment. A second community assessment was done in 2019, and it really showed that when we do come together to work on these issues, uh, we can make a difference. We found um, there was a decrease in youth binge drinking by 11%, a decrease in overall alcohol use by use by 13%, and a decrease of 12% in youth marijuana use. However, we did have an increase in 16% of youth vaping. So if you remember, this was all about the time of um, Juul and the big explosion of vaping across the country. But those numbers were much more in line with what we're seeing across the state. So that was really good news. So what's going on right now? So our most recent community assessment is going on right now. We, we haven't completed it, but it will be released to the school committee on January 18th, so you can tune into that meeting to see to hear the stats. Um, and the full community assessment will go out to the community um, in April. And if you're on, getting our newsletter, which you can sign up for at milton-coalition.org, you'll find out when those meetings are and you're welcome to attend. So why are we here? First of all, prevention never ends. There are always more families to educate. There are always new drugs, new potencies, new products, new dangers. When you consider marijuana specifically, the environment in which we're raising our children has changed. Um, now you have marijuana is everywhere and it's backed by millions of dollars uh, of marketing from corporations that are trying to make money. Um, so it's up to us to be educated about uh, marijuana and its dangers. And that's why we invited Dr. Hill to come to our community. Um, so before I introduce him, um, just a couple points. We have a live audience here at Town Hall. Thank you very much for being here. We also have many people that are joining us online. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I'd also like to thank the Town Administrator's Office, Tyler Vachon from the Milton Public Library, who's monitoring our Q&A, where you can post questions. Um, Bruce Talanen for helping out the door, my colleagues from the Health Department, and of course, Milton Access TV. Uh, we will have time for questions at the end. Those of you on Zoom can enter them into the Q&A. So, Dr. Hill is an addiction psychiatrist, director of the Division of Addiction Psychiatry at Beth Israel Medical Center, associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. His clinical research is focused primarily on medications and behavioral interventions that might help improve available treatments for those wanting to stop using marijuana. And he is the author of Marijuana, the Unbiased Truth of the, About the World's Most Popular Weed. So welcome, Dr. Hill. Great. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for coming. 
Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Margaret, obviously, and the coalition for working hard to arrange this. Uh, you know, a lot of work goes into it. And what, a, what a better way, I can't think of a better way to start 2023 than to come out and really try to educate folks on, on cannabis. You know, there's so much uh, misinformation out there, and that's really been the way that things have been going as we we're talking beforehand today, really for the last 10 years in Massachusetts as we've gone through all of the different levels, going through medical cannabis vote in 2012, uh, going through legalization of recreational use of cannabis in uh, 2018. And so, you know, these issues have not gone away. So it's a great time to really focus uh, on the evidence. So we're going to talk about the unbiased truth. My contact information is there. Th feel free to think of me as a resource moving forward. I should mention that prior to the talk, I, I was uh, privy to some of the questions that had been sent in ahead of time. So I've tried to tailor the talk a little bit to a lot of those questions. So I think I'll... Uh, address a few odds and ends, as you'll see, in terms of the organization, but certainly we'll have time for Q&A at the end, so feel free to uh, think of good questions. In terms of disclosures, a couple of books uh, on the topic over the years, so feel free to check those out. Um, and what we're going to cover today, really the basic science. So again, when we think about these votes that have happened in state after state, most states at this point have medical cannabis, and frankly, you know, more and more states are having legalized recreational cannabis, so Everyone has kind of been through this, and what you'll see is a lot of the information has been distorted by people who want people to vote one way or another. So we're going to focus really on what the science says. What are the facts? And we'll talk about it, good and bad, uh, tonight. We want to talk about the risks, really. So the, the angle that we're coming at tonight is really the impact of cannabis upon young people. Not 100%, though. I mean, I've, I've sprinkled in a few facts uh, for different age groups and some things related to some other issues, too, in cannabis. But for the most part, we're thinking about young people, the decisions that they have to make, what are the potential risks there for the developing brain. And when we say developing brain, we're talking about 25 and under. So the level of risks for those folks is much, much higher because, again, there's so much development that's going on at a rapid rate at a young age. And then finally, we're going to touch upon very briefly treatment. What does that look like? How do you go about doing that? Again, most people can't even fathom the idea that people would have a problem with cannabis that would require treatment. So we'll, we'll talk about what that actually looks like. So what do I do? I'm a clinician first and foremost at Beth Israel. So I've been running the Division of Addiction Psychiatry there for over five years now, but I've been in this field for about 20 years actually now. So I run that division. I'm training uh, the next generation of clinicians who are treating addiction there. I have a private practice, and I work with a lot of special populations, not just young people with cannabis problems, but also healthcare professionals, pilots, athletes. And amazingly, all of these groups at one point or another have had problems with cannabis. And so, you know, the issues look at the core the same, and it could be a different, you know, it could be alcohol, could be opioids or cannabis, but one of the points I want to impress upon you tonight is that people make choices about what their drug of choice is. So a given substance may not be as dangerous as another substance, but somebody can take their level of use of that substance, which may be inherently less harmful, to an incredibly harmful level. And that could cost them their job, could cost them relationships, could cost them their academic career. So that's something that I've seen over and over again. And when you think about who's talking to you or who's educating you or the public on these issues, think about what, where they're coming from, right? A lot of people have financial skin in the game or they have a very strong bent one way or another. I'm a, I'm a clinician. You know, I treat patients every day. I'm also a dad. I, you know, I have a, a teenage daughter and a preteen daughter. So, uh, so I know really where these issues come from and how to go about talking to people in a way that you can try to make some, some gains there. And we'll talk about that. How do you do that? How do you talk about these things in a sensible way in order to try to make progress from people, either at a, in a clinical venue or from a policy perspective? The research that I've done uh, has really focused in, in two areas over the last uh, decade or so. I'd say initially more small studies aimed at developing medications for those that have cannabis use disorder or cannabis addiction, and then more recently focusing on the medical indications for cannabinoids. What, what is the level of evidence for these uh, indications, and what are the risks, right? And as you'll see, a lot of the stuff that we've been working on over the years has been looking at the risks for some of these substances like cannabidiol, CBD, that we're going to talk about 
uh, today as well. And then the last bullet is what we're doing here. I think there is no greater example of the need for educational outreach than cannabis because there's so much misinformation. You've got people who think it's the greatest thing ever. It's a panacea for all different types of medical problems. They're selling all kinds of products that we'll talk about today. And then again, the, the other side, people believe that it's you know, as dangerous as fentanyl, right? It's not. But as you'll see, you know, again, if you make that decision that this is your thing and that's what you're using every day, the problems can look pretty similar, actually. And, and that's something that I've seen over the years. So try to educate people in a variety of venues like we're doing here in a town hall, policymakers when possible. But this stuff is very difficult to do, and that's why this is such a great opportunity, such a great platform, because if I can educate you, and then you in turn can work as a, in a coalition or other opportunities where you can influence policy, that's really how things get done. Because again, the train's left the station here. Whether or not you agree with these policies, we have these policies in a state like Massachusetts. So really, we need to be thinking about how can we address these issues, give people what they want, what they voted for, while mitigating risk. I think that's really what we need to think about from a policy perspective. Okay, keep going. Yeah, it doesn't bother me, I can read. So how did I get into cannabis? So I think it's important to point out that for those of you that treat addiction or have been involved with programs, my program is similar in the sense that the big two substances are really alcohol and opioids, so right? So we're not gonna minimize the, the dangers of these substances. These, in a tertiary care hospital, the majority of the problems that we see are with these issues. Um, so, you know, th that's sort of the entree into talking about things like cannabis. So for me, when I first finished my training and took my first job as an attending physician uh, in a partial hospital program, I found that when I sat down with these folks who were coming into treatment either for alcohol use disorder or opioid use disorder, that more than half of them would say that they use cannabis daily for years. And so the, the wheels started turning and I began to think, well, what would happen if you did really two things? Number one, identify a treatment that works for people who are using cannabis in a problematic way at a young age. And then number two, relative to what we're doing here today, let people know about it, right? And I say that because it's so important. There's so much great science that's done in the Commonwealth and other places around the world that nobody knows about. It's really hard to keep up with the science. I mean, this is what I do every day. And frankly, people will email me studies that I haven't seen. So when you begin to think about that, you begin to understand how the general public, it's virtually impossible for them to know what is good science. If there's a problem, what to do about it. So I, I really believe, and I still believe, that if we did those things for cannabis addiction, if we developed a treatment that works and we educated people about it, we would dramatically undercut the number of people who would come into treatment for alcohol use disorder or opioid use disorder. So it's so important. I mean, it's such an important mission that a lot of people are really engaged in, but perhaps not enough. So my point here is the, the critical importance of really trying to be balanced on this issue. And I think that when I think about being balanced on this very polarizing topic, I think you have to think about this from a clinical perspective and from a policy perspective. So I see people every day who come in with cannabis problems and they've been doing this daily for years. And so if I were just to say, look, talk about a lot of the risks that we're gonna talk about here tonight and just you know, say, hey, look, why are you doing this? I'm not gonna get anywhere. I at least need to try to understand the perceived benefit that they see here. And if you can do that, I think that you have a chance to engage in an ongoing discussion with them about this. Similarly, from a policy perspective, I think what we've seen play out in states like Massachusetts over and over again is that you have the pro side and the anti side battle it out. One side wins, and then the other side retreats and goes somewhere else thinking about the next state to win. And so then at the end of the day, you end up having policy that's very weak. And that's frankly what we have in, in states like ours. So in terms of uh, cannabis use, you know, the national statistics su suggest that, that it's not going away, right? 22, 24 million Americans using every year in, in the United States, and that represents a doubling over the past decade. About 10% of these folks are saying that they use medicinally. 
So the overwhelming majority of users of cannabis are recreational users, right? So you hear so much about the medical side and the need to have dispensaries, et cetera. Again, that's only really 10% of the use. So the overwhelming majority is really recreational use, and that's germane to the risk that we're going to talk about today. Similarly, you think about these messages that we hear in these votes, powerful messages that are fueled by people who have financial interests. And so the, the, it ends up kind of bogging down the science, which is why we're here. So the slide that I'm showing now really is talking about um, the percentage of people who develop an addiction. So it's critical to, again, be balanced on these issues and understand that most people who are using cannabis don't develop an addiction problem. It's about one in six adults who use um, may become, or excuse me, it's about 9% of adult users in about one in six young people. So that's about 17%. But the, the issue is when we talk about youth use, if we have six people and again, you know, only one of them goes on to, to, to have, a, have a problem, you know, I can't tell you which one it's going to be. So the predictive value of that is very difficult, which is why it's so critical really to educate the bulk of the population. Um, the slide here also depicts the, the notion that cannabis is less addictive than some other substances like nicotine, like opioids, et cetera. But as I introduced earlier, although in and of itself, cannabis may be less addictive than these other substances, again, you have a certain group of people, a subset of users who are using every day. And that's the individual that I'll see. It'll be you know, either a 16-year-old, a 20-year-old, I mean, really all ages, but there's a core group, probably 16 to 25, that are using every day, multiple times a day. And for that group, you know, they're meeting criteria for a cannabis use disorder, right? So it's important to point out that while on the whole, it may be less addictive or less harmful in some ways, people can take their use of a less harmful substance to a very dangerous level. There are degrees of danger. I think that's relevant when talking about how to approach this with young people. In order to have credibility, you know, I can't relay the message that this is as dangerous as fentanyl. It's not. Right? People aren't going to die from a cannabis overdose, but their use of cannabis can be very dangerous, as we'll talk about in a, in a few moments when talking about driving. All right, so as you can see, just to, to recap this slide, you know, depending on where you look, Again, the take-home points here, most people who are using cannabis aren't developing addiction problems. 10 to 30%, depending on where you look, of adults. For young people, it's one in six, about 17%. Comparing cannabis, its addictive potential in adults to other substances, generally less addictive, right? But like I said, people, if you talk to, to, to people who use substances, people will say, this is my thing, I like this, I don't like the way you know, alcohol makes me feel sluggish. I don't like that. You know, so people will choose a substance generally, and you know, their use of that substance can reach a dangerous level. So in terms of the trends, we talked about this before. One of the slides that I think you missed um, you know, that I was describing was just the idea that in this, um, you know, this day and age where we have th these policies in most states, the cannabis use is certainly on the rise, right? Accessibility. I mean, it's always been ubiquitous but there are cannabis stores everywhere. And that's really what this slide shows. We see adult use on the rise here, uh, clearly. And I think one thing that's key here as well, the purple slide, so we're talking about adult use here. In this study from Wilson Compton at NIDA that was in Lancet Psychiatry in 2016, they framed this purple uh, line here as perception of no risk of harm. And, and so keep that in mind. So as use is going up in adults, the risk is not going up, right? They, they don't think it's risky. So that's one of the take home points today is that people may be deciding to use a substance, but they're not doing it in an educated way. Uh, you know, from a medical perspective, we call this informed consent, right? You can make a decision to do something that may be harmful for you, but you have to understand what the risks are. And that really is not happening. And that's really where cannabis differs from other substances, particularly alcohol, nicotine, et cetera. So here, so the last slide was adults. Now we're looking at young people. So a couple things that are often misinterpreted, uh, misrepresented in this whole debate, right? We have the pro side, the anti side battling it out. So youth use in the context of this changing policy is relatively flat. So that's something that a lot of times 
the anti-cannabis people will say, you know, the policies are meaning that more and more kids are using. That's not really the case, and I would offer that that's because cannabis has never been hard to get, really, uh, for, for youth. It's more about having stores for maybe skittish adults who may say, oh, you know, I'm going to try an edible now, or I'm in Vegas, it's everywhere, let me try that. You know, so kids have always had that ability to use, and so that's been flat. However, importantly, as more and more stores have proliferated and people have tried to skew those votes, the perception of risk among kids is going down, right? So that's the opposite of the way that they framed it for the other slide. They said perception of no risk, but the take home message is the same. So as you've had more and more access to cannabis in the terms of stores and, and uh, laws, all groups, the perception of risk has gone down, frankly. So that's really the main issue for me, particularly with young people, because when you think about the job that we've done, coalitions have done, educating young people about alcohol and, can and uh, nicotine, excuse me, they've done a really good job. And, and so even with that good job, right, most kids are aware of the harms of alcohol. Most kids are aware that smoking cigarettes is bad for you, right? So numbers have gone down, both for drinking and for use of nicotine over the years. And unfortunately, despite that good job, we always have tragedies, right? They're almost unavoidable. I mean, we have that happen uh, every, every few weeks, right? A bunch of kids will be in a car, and they'll be drinking, and they'll be driving late, and, and bad things happen, right? So you can't eliminate those accidents from occurring completely, but I think you can rest assured, based upon the numbers that we've seen, that use of those substances have gone down because we've done a good job of educating kids on those issues. But vexingly, we haven't done that with cannabis, right? We have all these people in Massachusetts, right, talking about these votes over the years, and yet we've done a poor job. And why is that? I think part of it is there's a disagreement about how to go about it. And having you know, been doing this for quite some time with a, a variety of different uh, groups and organizations, I know there's a, a belief among a lot of people that you need to scare people away from using substances. It doesn't really work that way. And I, tell, and I like to tell a story where just a few years ago, uh, I was talking to a football, a professional football team, and you know, spent the day with them. And they were interested in talking about cannabis uh, in the context of their changing policies in, in the NFL and also CBD and things like that. And so I met with a, a bunch of different groups of players throughout the day. And as I was doing my last talk, the head coach came up to me and said, hey, hey, Doc, you know, I really need you to scare these guys away from this stuff, right? So that's the sort of well-meaning but just not very sophisticated view that so many people have. And so kids are smart. Right? So I, I maintain, and I've been saying this for years, that if I were to speak to a couple hundred young people in high schools, and I've done it all over the state and other states too, if I were to try to tell them, hey, this is just as dangerous as fentanyl, then I'm not going to get anywhere. I've got no credibility doing that. So when you think about it, those type of scare tactics have been proven not to work, but we continue to do that. That's one thing. I mean, I think the other thing is in a lot of school districts, and, and Massachusetts is a great example. A lot of places in Massachusetts, they don't want to take the time to try to educate people to change these numbers because they've got bigger fish to fry, right? They're thinking about AMCAS, right? We can't take time. I've heard this before over and over again from a lot of different people. We can't take the time to do this type of thing. You know, we've got to prep these kids for AMCAS tests and, and other things, right? So I think people would like to do these things but some people feel like they, they just can't have that opportunity. Or you know, there are other things. If I'm only going to do an hour of health education, I need to do it on X, that type of thing. So it's, it's a competitive environment in many ways. And as a, at the end of the day, we really haven't done a good job of educating young people on that issue. So let's, let's do that here. Let's talk about it. So I think overall, one of the points I want to make is that this topic is pretty complicated. But we're going to try to simplify it, right? Because again, there are a lot of red herrings here, a lot of things that people are trying to distract you about when they're trying to sell cannabis products. So we think about the cannabis plant. Uh, it's got hundreds of compounds in it, right? Cannabinoids are compounds that are specific to the cannabis plant. That's really what we have to focus on. There are over 140 of them. There are other things. Terpenes is one. Phenolic compounds another. 
I just mention those because it, I'm just introducing this concept that people like to talk about things that the data is a little fuzzy, we're not really sure what that does, and then sometimes people make great claims that, oh, if you have this thing that there isn't much evidence on, nobody really knows what it does, this product has this thing and it can do great things for you. And I think I'll show you some examples of that as we go. But really, simplistically, we only really need to know when it comes to potential risks for young people about two cannabinoids. Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, can make you high, obviously, can make you psychotic, depending on the individual, can cause anxiety in some individuals, and then cannabidiol, CBD, it's not intoxicating. Some people say it's not psychoactive. That's not true. Another bit of misinformation. It, it affects the way you feel, certainly, but it's not intoxicating. It probably has some antipsychotic properties, probably some anti-anxiety properties as well. The reason why these two go hand in hand is because, again, a little bit of science, they're competing for precursors at a plant level. And that's sort of why CBD, in a somewhat simplistic way, functions as a buffer to the potentially harmful effects of THC. And again, because they're competing, if you adjust the ratios, if you adjust the amount of THC, generally speaking, CBD will go down and vice versa. So when you hear about products, people talk about the potency, they talk about THC content, CBD content, ratios, et cetera. That's really what we're talking about here. However, I will also tell you that the overwhelming majority of the THC, the cannabis products that we're talking about, have very, very high THC content. And we'll, we'll talk about that over and over as we go. So let's talk about some key myths and then we'll take a few tangents off here just based upon what people are interested in. Um, myths are that it's not harmful, not addictive, no withdrawal. So in terms of the potential harms, again, we're thinking about the population, talking about young people, developing brains, 25 and under. Right, so still under construction. So the decisions that you make, the decisions that kids make, how you help them make these decisions are so critical, right? Because this, this time, what they're doing during these developmental periods are really gonna affect uh, how they turn out down the road. Um, thinking about the impact in the various potential downstream impacts of, of cannabis, you have to think about the receptors uh, cannabinoid receptors. So there are really at least two types of cannabinoid receptors and they're located all over the brain and so therefore pretty much everything the brain does can be affected by cannabis, right? So there are various spots. The hypothalamus has to do with appetite, right? Cannabis and appetite. Amygdala, anxiety, paranoia, right? Fight or flight syndrome. Hippocampus, so memory, things of that sort. Cerebellum, motor. So really everything the brain can do can be affected by cannabis and cannabinoids. So let's talk specifically about the impact of cannabis when you use. So acute, so that's today, chronic, tomorrow. So what are the potential ramifications of using cannabis? So acute impact. So a lot of people don't talk about that as much. So what will it do? It can definitely impair your judgment. It can put you in predic predicaments that you wouldn't otherwise get into, right? Similar to alcohol in, in that way. Coordination and motor skills, driving, we're gonna talk about in a minute. So clearly cannabis can affect that. We'll talk about how that happens in a second. Short-term memory, learning difficulties in, acu in an acute way. People can have an acute psychotic reaction. Sometimes it's transient. Most of the time it's not, we'll talk about that too. But let's talk about driving, right? So I think it's important. People talk about the impact of cannabis and alcohol upon driving. Let's talk about it in a very simple way. So I like to sing, it's not mine, right? I don't wanna you know, make you think I'm, I'm that smart and created something this creative. But when you're drunk, you run red lights. When you're stoned, you stop at green lights. It talks about the different kinds of errors that you make when you're using substances. So if I were to use alcohol, have several drinks and get behind the wheel, I'm gonna have what we call errors of omission, right? I'm not gonna check my mirrors. I might lay on the gas. I'm not gonna do the things that I should be doing. So errors of omission. Cannabis is different and patients will kind of describe this. They'll say that, look, you know, I, I drive really well. They, this is what they say. I drive really well when I'm using cannabis, right? So you overcorrect. That's what, really what happens there. So there are errors of commission. So you might be extra careful and extra cautious, 
but you may end up driving 25 in a 75. So that's equally dangerous, really. So it's just a different kind of mistake. And importantly, one thing that I should point out is that the data is very clear that both people who use alcohol and cannabis are notoriously poor at assessing their impairment, right? So the way that these substances affect you is different, but at the end of the day, they both affect you. Other variables are at play, your experience with a substance, what you're using that day, your body type, et cetera. So in that way, it's similar too, but the errors that you make are different. And again, importantly, people are, are in, it's a very difficult thing to assess somebody's ability to drive safely after using substances. So how does that become an issue? I know we've got people here who are experts uh, in this area, but when we talk about driving, again, how do you assess safety there? It, it becomes very challenging. There's no breathalyzer, right? So there's no 0.08 blood alcohol equivalent for cannabis. You can't do a breathalyzer. A lot of really smart people are working on these issues, but at, as of this moment, the technology does not exist to test for cannabis in a way comparable to alcohol. So because we have these laws, and again, this is just my opinion, a lot of people have a lot of different opinions on this, we have people out there using, right? The stores are everywhere, so they're using and driving. So I think that you have to figure out, given the tools that you have, the best way to hold people accountable. So how do you do that? So blood level is one way to do that, but importantly, the problem with the blood level is, you know, if you have a high blood level above a threshold with cannabis, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're impaired, right? Your blood can, the level can remain high for a period of time. But it does mean something. It matters in some way. So if you can combine that with another measurement, so field sobriety testing, for example, uh, I think you can do a pretty good job. When you think about it, and this is an op-ed that I wrote almost a year ago with uh, the Newton police chief, John Carmichael, again, my thought is that you know, we have to give, in the sense that we have medical and recreational use in the Commonwealth, we have to give our law enforcement better tools to hold people accountable for the choices that they're making. And so to me, if you think about, number one, a justified stop, number two, field sobriety testing, and number three, a blood level, if you do all those things, I think that's the best you can do at this moment. And I think one of the things I would, would leave you with is people who argue about these things and say, well, you know, this doesn't really correlate to uh, impairment, what, what do they suggest? What, what are they offering as a solution here? Do they just think that people should, you know, they should be allowed to drive impaired and there's no way to hold people accountable? So I'm just talking about trying to take the tools that we have and do the best that we can while hopefully other science is developed. And I think that also introduced one other key notion that I would mention is that when we think about the millions of dollars, perhaps billions of dollars, if we're thinking nationwide, that are being made by companies and generated by states like ours in taxation, are we really advancing the science at the rate that we should, at the scale that we should? I'd say no, and I think that's one of the major problems for me is that, again, I've been doing this for a long time, and unfortunately, we have made progress, clearly, but the rate and scale of that progress has not kept pace with the interest and the use and the amount of money that's been generated. I think you know, that's something we have to take a hard look at. So chronic effects of cannabis. So we're talking about, importantly, I think one of the things that when people who are staunchly opposed to cannabis, one of the things they don't talk about is this idea that when I'm talking about chronic use, the dose makes a huge difference. So we're not talking about somebody who uses once a week, every week for years. We're talking about people who, if they come to see me, they're using every day, multiple times a day. So if you're doing that at any age, particularly a young age, it's gonna affect your cognitive abilities. So for young people in particular, using at a young age, usually below 16, leads to poor cognitive function and potential for even IQ decline. And, and again, I should also point out that any important study that comes out like this, because it's such a hotly contested, so much money involved, people will debate it. But I would tell you that the papers that, that I've cited here, and if you can't access them, let me know, I can, I can try to help you do that. But these are peer-reviewed studies, so that's also another thing. Some people who say so much about cannabis and are so willing to critique other studies, they've never written a single study. 
or they've written one or two, right? They've never done these kind of trials. So these, it's really hard to do the work that these scientists have done and to get it published in the places they've gotten published. So you can say, you know what? I don't believe the Madeline Meyer 2012 IQ study, and you can point to reasons why you think it's poor, but it's in a top journal. Proceedings National Academy of the Sciences, one of the best journals in all of science. So you know, you're saying it's in there erroneously? So those are the kinds of things that we're debating all the time. Um, again, chronic use worsens anxiety, worsens your mood. The anxiety piece, one of the key reasons that people come in, like when I talk to them and say, hey, why do you tell me what it does for you? A lot of people feel like it helps their anxiety, but unfortunately what happens is if you're anxious and you use, anxiety goes down in the moment, but when cannabis wears off, your anxiety goes back up. So there's sort of the seesaw effect. Overall, baseline level of anxiety increases. So no one is going to recommend anybody that, um, you know, I would say follows the science is going to recommend using cannabis to treat anxiety. Worsening suicidal ideation, and then this piece here, which is really scary, increased risk for psychosis. Over and over and over again, it's been shown that if you have a family history of a psychotic disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder with psychotic features, if you use cannabis regularly at a young age, you increase the likelihood that you're going to express one of those disorders. And I should also share, having treated many patients like this, once that happens, there's no going back. You know, we can treat that, and hopefully people will take medication that they're supposed to take, but overall prognosis is very, very poor. People don't want to take the medications that they need to take when they're psychotic. So that's why it's so critical, especially if you're, you have a family history of one of these problems, you need to educate your kids and say, look, you know, at the, at the end of the day, the risk for you is much greater than somebody else. And that's unfortunate. A lot of this kind of work involves that. Unfortunately, you can't do what your peers can do and get away with it. And that, that's hard for a lot of kids to, to come to grips with. So I mentioned this, just another resource is a paper that I published uh, uh, a little more than a year ago. So, you know, when I mentioned worsens anxiety, worsens depression, this is a good place if you want to start learning about the psychotic uh, illnesses and the impact of cannabis upon other psychiatric illnesses is a good place to start there. And then just t throwing this in there, because I know there are other groups and, and somebody had asked a question. Um, so we talked about youth use, but clearly long-term chronic use of cannabis impacts all age levels, right? So this was a study, again, by Madeline Meyer, who's a, a prime investigator. And this one was published in 2022 another longitudinal study, and in this one, they looked at cannabis use over many years, and in midlife, long-term use declined, and an average IQ declined an average of 5%. So that's, you know, we're talking almost a standard deviation there. Dose-dependent effects, so that's another point here. A lot of these effects really depend, as I said before, on the dose. So how much you use over what period of time, learning, processing speed, memory, attention, and then cannabis, had more adverse effects than other substances, alcohol and tobacco. So I just threw that in there because people were interested. Here's another one uh, related to questions that we get. Cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. So this is something we're seeing more and more. Just had a, another patient at the end of last week present to the ER with this issue. Chronic cannabis use, one of the things that you see, overstimulation of the cannabinoid receptors, the endocannabinoid resist, uh, system, and nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, people present to the ER. Sometimes they say, look, only taking really hot showers helps me relax. Um, but this is a problem. Fortunately, you can stop using cannabis and this will relent. But what we have often seen is that people will have multiple episodes, right? They're not really sure. Maybe wherever they went, the diagnosis wasn't clear or they didn't believe it, that it was related to cannabis and they go back to using it. So, Sometimes you have this happen over and over again. But emergency department uh, clinicians are getting very, very wise on this, and they're very smart. And frankly, a lot of them have contacted me about my patients going to the ED. Like I said, I just had another one last week. So this is something we see over and over again. So these are really serious problems that people have related to, again, probably on the whole, less dangerous substance, right? You're not going to have a fatal overdose like fentanyl, but you might end up in the ER here. And then addiction, just briefly, we're trying to pick up the, the pace here a little bit uh, so we can finish on time, hopefully. But 
a lot of people still have a hard time understanding or believing that cannabis is addictive. So like I said before, it's a subset of individuals. This slide, we think about the nucleus accumbens, the pleasure center of the brain, and this shows that for various substances, so stimulants like amphetamine, cannabis here, cheesecake, I would say, you know, whatever, whatever your vice may be, but the point is, when you use substances or you do things that are pleasurable, eating, gambling, et cetera, you see here there's a, a release of neurotransmitters, dopamine. The scales are different, I wanna point out there, but overall when you're doing these things, when you're using these substances, you have a release of dopamine. So again, this idea of degrees of danger, right? Amphetamines, uh, cocaine, other stimulants, people certainly would say they're definitely addictive, right? And they're definitely dangerous. Cannabis is doing the same thing for certain individuals. So just to, to hammer home that point. And, and if you are you know, open to that idea that there is a cannabis addiction, we look at medical marijuana states, so the policy also affects that. So there's a nice paper from 2017, Deborah Hassan who's at Columbia. In medical marijuana states, cannabis use, the increase is at a, a, a steeper slope, right? So the laws do matter. Here. So these are things that we have and we have to understand, and, and we've seen it too. You know, we have a lot of people coming in meeting criteria for cannabis use disorder. And then finally, withdrawal. So if you use cannabis every day, multiple times a day, and you stop abruptly, you're gonna have physical withdrawal. So this is a nice uh, set of studies. Alan Budney is at Dartmouth, Ryan Vandry is a colleague at, at uh, Hopkins, and they compared the cannabis withdrawal to nicotine withdrawal, something we're more familiar with anxiety, irritability, difficulty sleeping. And so as you can see, the degrees of these particular symptoms may be different, but on the whole, it looks pretty similar in many ways. So that's something you have to prepare people for. If they're using every day and they're gonna stop, they might have some withdrawal. Can we treat that? Yes, we can treat that. Gateway drug, another great question. Does use of cannabis lead to other drug use? Is it a causal relationship? So that's sort of an American thing, right? Automatically, if I'm 13 years old and I'm using cannabis, does that mean in five years I'm gonna be using heroin? That's what a causal relate, my use of cannabis, is it gonna cause the, no, that's not how it works. So if that's the definition of gateway, it's not a gateway drug. However, what we see, young people, again, 12 to 15 or so, using either marijuana or you know, nicotine vaping, these days probably more common than smoking cigarettes, or drinking. And so if your person in that age, if your loved one in, in that age group is doing one of those three things, I'm really worried about it, right? It doesn't mean automatically that in five or 10 years you're gonna be using fentanyl, but they're opening the door there. I'm very concerned. We have to treat that very, very seriously, right? It, it's a worrisome, risky, impulsive, risk-taking behavior at a young age. Potency is rising, 60s, 70s, and 80s, average THC content for those of you who may have used back then, three to four percent. Nowadays, the published data, average THC content is around 20. So if you go to any of these stores around here, I've got one less than a mile away from my hospital. I've got a whole bunch near my house. Two, if you go into these stores, you can easily buy flour in the 20s and 30s. So again, with this idea of the dose affecting the adverse effects, Stronger cannabis, more problems, right? And we're not even talking about uh, concentrates, which we're gonna talk about very briefly in a minute. So just introducing these other concepts, synthetic cannabinoids, concentrates, vaping, edibles. Synthetics, fake cannabis, the take home points there, who's gonna use this? People are being drug tested. So if you're in a group home, you're in the military, you're on probation, you might use these substances there's no CBD, there's no buffer. So they're really harmful, more harmful than regular cannabis, frankly. Um, vaping, we've talked about a little bit, just this idea, keep in mind, obviously these days, kids are vaping, it's not just nicotine, you can easily get vape pens that have THC. Um, you can modify you know, nicotine to, to THC as well, but for the most part, you can just buy them these days. And then we'll talk more about concentrates and edibles quickly. So edibles, Probably the best example in my mind of poor education. Paper just came out, uh, just with it, just at the end of last week. Uh, over a 1,300% increase in emergency department poisonings over the last handful of years relative to these policies. So you have these policies, 
You have people, there's all different reasons for that, right? Could be packaging. So if it's, uh, you know, I showed you this slide before. So this right here, two-year-old, it's shiny, I'm gonna put it in my mouth. Eight-year-old, I like Kit Kats, I'm gonna do that. Um, or adults, they just don't understand the science. So an average serving size in a brownie like this is uh, 10 mil, so the whole brownie will have 100 milligrams. Serving size is 10 milligrams, so that's just a chunk. I don't know about you, but when I'm having a brownie, I'm not saying, hey, I'm gonna take one-tenth of this <laughs> and put it in. I mean the whole thing. So that's really what's happened over and over again. Again, people, I say Vegas just because every time I go there, I, I'm just totally overwhelmed with the, the stench uh, of THC there. So I know people are, are buying the products there. So people who are trying, you know, in, initially using, they don't get it. So they might take a bite, nothing happens. So again, that also is the onset of action. It takes about 30 minutes or so for an edible product. Take a bite, nothing happens. Take another bite, nothing happens. When it all hits 30 minutes later, maybe I've got 40 milligrams and somebody who's really not experienced, boom, that's how you end up in the ER. So that's one way. So there are a lot of different reasons for this, but I think it's the greatest shame in all of this. This is really not that complicated, and yet, as you see, I mean, we're 2023, and we just have, this continues to happen over and over again. So we're not learning, that's another thing, we're not learning from Colorado and these other states. Everybody is in silos and worried about other stuff. We're not getting better. When you talk about science and you have a protocol in place to do a study or even a clinical protocol, you, know, you constantly look at it and figure what's working, what's not working, you make it better. We're not doing that here. When we think about medical cannabis laws in Massachusetts, there really have been very, there's been very little substantive change over the years here. Concentrates, wax, shatter, 80 to 90% THC. Dose dependent, when you think about using something that strong, it can make you really high, obviously, but you can also have problems. Psychosis, hyperemesis are more likely to occur in people using concentrates. That's why it's also critical when you talk to somebody, if you're, if you're treating one of these individuals, you need to really ask them, so tell me exactly what you're using. You know, are you using flour? Do you use concentrates? A lot of people will say, yeah, if I can use, if I get access to it, I might do it. Some people eventually say, you know what, if I can get this, I'm gonna to try to do this more often. And eventually some people, so there's a subset of individuals that becomes their primary substance they're using. So now they're using really, really strong cannabis products on a near daily basis and uh, haywire can result. Another request, something that I'm constantly asked about, people thinking about harm reduction, look, and again, this gets, uh, uh, you know, again, just, uh, to, to, just before COVID, I think it was, I was at a major um, football program in the South and spent the day with everybody talking to a bunch of people and groups and some individual. And at the end of the day, you know, the trainer gave me the phone and said, look, coach is on the line one more time, wants to talk to you. And he said, and he'd already asked me this question once. And he said, look, Doc, I just want to be clear. Like if one of my guys, you know, if it's a choice, if it, 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 drinking or cannabis, which one, which one's better? And that's the classic false choice. You don't have to do one of these things. And when you compare it, it's actually a slide that I show um, with the local um, baseball team, as a matter of fact, when we talk to the minor leaguers every year. But so again, everyone is interested in this, particularly athletes. When you compare it, you know, both of these substances are addictive. Neither of those enhances your performance, both of them affect your ability to perform the next day. So again, when you're thinking about hitting a baseball, or you're thinking about playing football, that much could be the difference between you getting a scholarship, between you making the major leagues, you know, it, it depends. But that's clear, it affects your performance. And they really, they're not proven to help with sleep. I mean, it's another myth. You know, both of these substances decrease the amount of time you spend in REM sleep, which is the restorative sleep. So when people say, which one, I say, well, I don't really think you need either one of these things, right? You don't need to rely, uh, and if you think you do, then let's talk. Why do, what do you think you're getting out of it? Maybe there's some, you know, some other way we can go about treating that problem that you have. Cannabidiol, CBD, so been kind of hot for the last five or six years or so, perhaps slowing down a little bit, but things to remember about this, so again, this is kind of this idea, another cannabinoid that people have been really excited about selling all kinds of products 
You know, I should mention um, not long ago, a couple months ago, um, you know, at my house, I mentioned I have a wife, two daughters. There's an endless parade of packages that show up in my house. So I think a couple months ago, I don't know what prompted me, but I was looking at some of these packages, and I, I know I, I might have opened one or one was open, and there was a CBD, you know, I think it was a, an oil or something. And I, I was like, what the heck is this in my house? And my wife had ordered it. And, you know, some person in her networking group was selling it or something like that. And she's like, oh, yeah, I heard it was great for such and such. So if this is happening in my house, <laughs> right, then it, it happens everywhere. Everyone wants to think about ways to improve their health. So I don't blame them for that. But what we have to do is we have to have people be educated about what the risks are. There are risks, real risks, with CBD. Depends on how much you take, right? So if you go you know, around us, if Harvard Square and some people are putting in their coffee at, at you know, 10 milligrams, that's probably a placebo. But if you're taking hundreds of milligrams, the doses that are needed to treat seizures, that's what the FDA approval is for, there can be serious problems. So only this one product, Epidiolex, is FDA approved. So 99% of CBD that people are using is not FDA approved. There is promise here, but most of it is preclinical. So that's not human studies. We're talking about animal studies. And then as a result of it not being FDA approved, the bulk of these products, they're not regulated. They're often mislabeled. So a series of studies by another uh, friend of mine who uh, has done this work, Marcel Bon Miller, both in 2017 and 2022, what they found with a couple of different CBD samples, uh, different types of products, about 30% of these products are accurately labeled. So most are not. So again, you don't really know what you're getting in these cases. But if you do get CBD and you do take it at proper doses, you can have problems. Liver toxicity, this study had people who were in one of the seizure disorder studies uh, liver enzymes are up to five times normal limit in, in, a, in a, a majority of those patients, frankly, or almost half of them, excuse me. Uh, it's also a problem when people are using CBD instead of treatments that have more evidence. So that's another thing that I've seen. People have come in and said, hey, doc, you know, I heard about you. I want to do this. You know, I want to use a natural treatment instead of whatever the treatments are for, let's say, you know, serious depression. That's not a good idea. Right? We don't have the evidence for that. Drug-drug interactions, another paper uh, that I worked on, co-author. If you're taking serious doses of CBD, it impacts the other drugs that you're taking, other medications. Most patients that I have aren't taking you know, just CBD. They're, they have five or six medications. And then finally, if you're taking serious doses of CBD, it's really expensive. So overall, just not the answer in many cases. And I would offer you that we're seeing this sort of playbook play out over and over again with other cannabinoids, right? I mentioned earlier, over 140 cannabinoids, CBG, CBDA. I had another colleague of mine email me the other day saying, CBDA, uh, somebody, you know, they forwarded me an email from a company saying, oh, this is great for protecting against concussions. Well, is there any human data? No. So that's really what's happening over and over again. We may find that one of these cannabinoids is great for something, but we're, we're nowhere near close to that. So I think we have to condition ourselves to understand that there's a process in place. You can do the science, and they did it for CBD for seizures, but they haven't done it for so many of these other medical indications. We're learning what they can do, minimal human data. So it's very premature. You know, when you hear about the next great thing, and people are selling these things, you gotta be skeptical. And then finally, uh, then we'll, we'll take some questions. What do you do if somebody might have a problem? Well, you need to get help, certainly. Quick case, kind of a typical case. Mark, 15-year-old high school kid, comes to me, get, got suspended for selling marijuana. If they get caught selling marijuana, they're using a lot of marijuana generally. Um, treated for anxiety, I mentioned that because most times that people have a problem that rises to the level of a cannabis use disorder or cannabis addiction, it's not occurring in a vacuum. There are other issues going on. It can be a psychiatric problem, could be a serious psychosocial issue, uh, and this, you know, he said he'd rather be messed up. It's not the, the, the word that he used, of course, but that's sort of the typical presentation. For, for families, you know, and teachers and staff, what do you think about Social problems caused or worsened by 
substances or alcohol, giving up important activities. My example there, you know, if somebody play, has played soccer for years, town soccer, summer soccer, et cetera, and now they're a second year high school student and they're not playing soccer, doesn't mean that they have a cannabis problem, but it might. So you have to know what the baseline is and when somebody deviates from the norm, you have to be able to tell that. So you have to know, you have to talk to them about you know, what their normal is. Use in dangerous situations, kids in cars with cannabis is kind of what I've seen. And then use despite obvious other diagnosed problems, right? And so for me, a typical referral might be young kid with ADHD and we're on stimulant number three, nothing's working, and then we figured out you know, what he's smoking four times a day that kind of thing. So it's hard, you know, these are more subtle things than people having an overdose, right? Like that's not gonna happen, but these other things, this is sort of how cannabis problems present. How do you get this thing moving? Well, number one, you have to be prepared. You have to think about what are you gonna do? You have to talk about these issues and then think about, you have a conversation, say, hey look, I'm concerned about this. You know, you find cannabis in somebody's room or something like that. I'm concerned about you. I think you need to see a professional. And you know, you're not saying that they have a problem. You're not saying that treatment's necessary, but you're saying, look, let's talk to somebody who does this every day to figure out if you do need that. Getting an evaluation, making a referral for treatment where necessary. Challenges here, cannabis is very different. I've never had, and I've been doing this for many years now, I've never had somebody call me up and say, hey doc, I hear that I can lose up to eight points of my IQ if I keep smoking weed every day. So that's never happened. They always are coming in pushed by their family, pushed by their school, spouses, et cetera. So that makes it harder. So there's a lot of problems out there that we're not being, you know, we're not made aware of, unfortunately. It's much more subtle. Public perception, of course, this idea about the rest of my life, people have been doing this every day. They can't fathom not ever doing it again. And I try to take that off the table. I actually was just saying that last week when I met with, I think he was 19, and his parents said, I'm not talking about that. Let's, it's, it's not productive. Let's talk about what we need to do for the next few months, which is usually what I like to think of as a limited period at least of abstinence. And that's hard, as I mentioned this before. Do, you know, these are things that people have come to rely upon, coping strategies, and to give it up when your peers don't have to is, is very difficult. Treatment, of course, you're not gonna go away usually for treatment for a cannabis use disorder. We're just trying to get people to talk to somebody. Initial work with somebody like me is just kind of building an alliance a lot of times. A lot of my work involves trying to help people see that they need to do something that they don't want to do. And you know, it takes time to do that. Oftentimes, it doesn't happen right away. So you need to kind of build that alliance, and then when they're ready to do it, hopefully they call you back. And that's really what's happened over the years. Treating co-occurring disorders, you have to be able to do that. Uh, cannabis use disorder is not occurring by itself. Most of this treatment is outpatient. So overall, critical period here. It, cannabis is here to stay. We have all these policies in place in Massachusetts, so we need to do a better job of educating people. I mean, that's really what I've always wanted here with adults and kids, just give people better tools to make smarter choices. They can make whatever decisions they want, but they have to have the information. And as I said before, the, the perception of risk indicates that they really don't have the best information right now. Lots of risks, there's a, definitely a much higher risk group uh, uh, when we think about young people. And finally, again, I wanna emphasize, no matter how bad it seems, no matter how many problems people have, problems with cannabis and any other substance can be successfully treated. You know, these things, if, if there's really, I think about sort of a combination of evidence-based treatment, a patient being ready, and then kind of using a lot of energy around the treatment, and, and people can do very well. So I just wanna thank my team uh, back at the BI who kind of makes it easier for me to prepare to do talks like this. So I wanna thank them, the boots on the ground with me on a daily basis. And then there's a survey that you guys can fill out and I'm happy to take some questions. I know we're a little over, but I'm happy to take some questions uh, anyway. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill. Um, I want to open it up to the room. If anybody has any questions um, in order to be heard, you do need to step up to the mic, if you would. I can repeat the question, too. OK. Why don't... Uh, what are you doing to educate uh, pediatricians? My son, we saw you, and I talked to his pediatrician. Oh, now I want to use it. Oh, everybody's using it. Tell us like five years ago. 
Yeah, so, so I was t we're talking about this uh, before the talk. Um, you know, I'm constantly doing um, continuing medical education um, uh, seminars with a variety of groups, including pediatricians, but I would tell you that clinicians like that, most pediatricians are super busy. They don't have a lot of opportunities to get CMEs, and you know, there's a lot of uh, times when they aren't up to date, and so a lot of the doctors that refer patients to me, I, you know, I'll talk to them after I see somebody, and frankly, you know, they, they aren't really up on, on a lot of the data. I think one of the things that you mentioned is a, a key concept, and I know a lot of people find it hard to believe, but when you think about young people, young people, the data indicate, think, and their families, they think that more of their peers are using than is actually true. You know, I mean, it is a lot of kids, right? We're talking about a third, generally, of students using cannabis, but they think everyone's doing it when it's really not. So you don't, you don't have to do this. It's not an absolute. But I, I, I hear what you're saying. I think it's a great point that you know, we, we, as a whole, as a field, we need to do a better job of educating people. Given the proliferation of cannabis, you know, we have to continue to educate at all levels. Any more questions from the room? Yes, if you would repeat it. That's sure. So do I see the same issue arising with uh, hallucinogens, mushrooms? Um, I, not, at, not at this level. I think you know, you're not going to have stores on every corner selling hallucinogens. I mean, for those of you that don't know, there has been a lot of interest in recent years, uh, last handful of years, about thinking about um, m mushrooms and other synthetic hallucinogens in terms of treating psychiatric illness, and some, some interesting data certainly, but I don't think on a wide scale these products are going to be sold. Nothing like cannabis. I mean, can, you know, the, the industry is just huge and, again, burgeoning at this point. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I assume a, a high is a high, so with things like edibles where you can't smell it, you know, how are schools and, um, you know, how do you kind of It's difficult. So, so you mentioned, so the, the question was, uh, you know, you said, the, the person said a high is a high, but with things like edibles where it's harder to tell if somebody's using, you're not smelling uh, smoke, for example, how, what, do school, what can schools do? And, and so I think it's relevant for edibles, but perhaps even more relevant, really vape, vape pens. You know, it's easy to, you know, keep a, keep a pen, you know, in somebody's hoodie and that kind of thing, and kids are doing that constantly. So that's something that's been going on for a number of years, and People will put detectors in bathrooms and things like that, and it's sort of a cat and mouse game. Very challenging. I think that uh, it, what, what I think would be better is more of an upstream educational process, or again, help, helping kids understand nicotine is not something, or cannabis, you know, depending on what they're vaping, is not something that we want them to do. But it's hard, right? I mean, these are smart, clever people, and if they want to hide their use, uh, it, it's very difficult. So we want them to understand you know, upstream the choices that they're making. Another question. Yeah. Another question. I have a question. So um, you were talking a little bit about CBD and then yep. you were talking about THC. Are they, they both come out of the same plant. Yes. But are they together when you're smoking weed, for example, but just extracted from the CBD oil? Yep. And my next question is, why does CBD create liver issues that smoking marijuana yeah. doesn't? Yeah, that's great. That's actually a really uh, great question. So when you're talking about THC, CBD, they travel together. Are they together when you, when you smoke? So flower, cannabis, yes. You've got THC, CBD, generally in a one-to-one -one ratio, uh, but, you know, again, depending on how, the potency of it, how much CBD, uh, THC you have can affect the, the adverse outcomes. Um, and then, yes, you absolutely can isolate CBD products. However, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is that while a, C a cannabis product may have higher CBD, it still may have a lot of THC in it. So that's one issue. So people may uh, have a positive urine drug screen for an employer physical or something like that. Or if they are told that they're having a pure CBD product again, Depending on the product, it can be hard to isolate the THC. So that's something that we've seen for many years now in sports. You know, people saying, "Hell, I, I, this is a CBD product," but they also didn't didn't pass a drug test there. So 
It's hard to completely extract it. Your question about the liver, that's something that we're really not, not clear on. But I will say THC alone has not been shown to impair the liver. And I think CBD is, uh, fortunately, that's one of the areas where we are doing some work. And again, you know, as we'll find out about these other cannabinoids, maybe their, their potential benefits, also their potential risks. Thanks for, no, no, thanks. thanks for sharing. Thank you. Um, I think we have a question for on, from online. Yeah, um, yeah so we have a, a Zoom question. Um, as a parent with a teenager and a preteen, how do you address marijuana use with them? Uh, what is your approach? And how can parents, friends, et cetera, do this at home to have a positive impact uh, without the judgment? So the way I think about it is, and again, my kids are sick of talking about these things, but I think you need to build it before you need it. You know, I think you have to, with all these kind of sticky, uncomfortable topics, you know, it, it can be awkward to do it initially, but I think what you do by asking about it, and again, they're not going to answer my questions on my, on my timeline, you know, certainly, but I think if you ask the questions, you're kind of saying, hey, I think this is important. So when they're ready to talk more about it, they will. And I think that's, that's really what I've tried to create, you know, this, this idea that these are the important issues. I don't have all the answers. You know, I want to know what your experience is, what is going on at school. So I think that if you are kind of building these bridges, when the time comes that it's important to talk about these issues, I think that you have a much better chance, right? You can never completely be sure, but you want to create an open dialogue where possible. Go ahead. Another question via Zoom. Um, do you recommend any local organizations for families to go to for help if they find use concerns in their family? Yeah, so that's a, a great question too. When, it talk, when we talk about young people in particular, um, you know, the major hospitals, you know, many of them have particular addiction programs. So um, Mass General has a program they call ARMS and uh, the Children's Hospital has a program too. Um, my, my hospital is really 19 and above, but in my private practice, you know, I'll, I'll see younger patients. So, you know, I would encourage everybody, you know, if there's a question about resources, certainly you have coalitions and things, but you can always ask your primary care doctor, you know, what, there may be treatment resources that they're affiliated with that could be the next step for you. So, you know, if you're not comfortable asking your doctor about these issues, you might want to find a new doctor. So I think that, you know, you should be comfortable saying, hey, this is a concern, or if you're, you know, you're at a pediatrician visit, you know, kind of encouraging them to have those conversations. Sometimes we all need a bit of prompting, right? I may think when I see somebody that these are the top three issues and I'm not aware, so that's another great reason to have open dialogue with uh, loved ones and other collateral sources of information. Thank you, Dr. Hill. I just want to tell everybody online, um, please check out our website. It's milton-coalition.org. We have a ton of resources on there, including how to talk to your kids, um, tips, exact scripts, you know, when to start, i.e. very young, you know, like three. <laughs> There are all kinds of things you can do to set the stage for prevention for all kinds of risky behavior. So please check out our, our website. Sign up for our newsletter if you don't already, uh, if you aren't already getting it. And uh, I just want to thank you so much for being here. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.